Welcome to the Career Now podcast. I'm your host, Jedi Henry, and on today's show, we have Emma Campbell. Emma is a visiting fellow at the Strategic and Defense Studies Center at the College of Asia and the Pacific at Australian National University. She has also held roles as a postdoctoral fellow at the Australian National University inside their Career Institute and has been an advisor to Australia's Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Development. Emma is also the owner and operator of the website NK Humanitarian, which focuses on humanitarian issues affecting North Korea. And she is the author of the book, South Korea's New Nationalism, The End of One Korea. And it's this that we're going to focus on today, this incredibly delicate and hard to pin down issue of nationalism, and of course specifically, Korean nationalism. There is a long run in understanding both inside and outside of Korea that it is a country and a nationalism based on ethnocentrism. They are one race, one people, and this is what binds them together most fundamentally. And this is what, for many people, is the impetus still for reunification. But Emma takes a very different view from this. Through on-the-ground interviews, first-person research, and the development of an extremely rigorous theoretical framework around what nationalism is and just how it is that we can understand it, her thesis instead focuses on what Korea is becoming today and the disconnect between the younger generations and the old and what ideas actually animate their lives, what ideas make them a nation. There is little doubt of the importance of the ethno-nation state inside Korea, of course, and its central importance at periods such as that of the Japanese colonization. But ideas like this change, they bend, and there's no reason that they should sustain indefinitely, simply because they are taught, or simply because there is a collective memory or a collective history around these ideas. Rather, in Emma's words, what South Korea is witnessing today, and the change that has happened on the ground, is something that she describes as the emergence of a globalized cultural nationalism based upon shared cultural values, modernity, cosmopolitanism, and status, and influenced in their formation and expression by globalization and neoliberal values. Just what this means in detail and just how this manifests on the ground, I'm going to let Emma explain by herself. But of course, for anyone who has studied either South Korea or North Korea, or has any sort of interest in the two countries, they will immediately know just how central this question of Korean nationalism is in so much of the debates and so much of the academic literature. And through Emma's research here, and through her book, which of course I'm going to link below, is a new and important take on this. A shift from the past, and an understanding of a new dynamic nationalism, which of course applies to South Korea, but also must have implications broader and to other countries around the world. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. And if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting it directly at the Patreon account or the PayPal link attached below. Failing that, it is always important that you follow, like, or share the podcast across social media. This, of course, is the most helpful thing you can do. On that, and to talk us through South Korea's new nationalism, this is Emma Campbell. Emma Campbell, thanks for coming on the Career Now podcast. Thank you for having me. So we're going to be speaking through the rise of what you call uh, new nationalism in South Korea today. And this is something that I've touched on in other podcasts with other professors, as in some of the history of this. But you have a very interesting thesis here, and this is an idea that South Korea's nationalism is changing fundamentally and quickly before our eyes. And it's become something that many people perhaps are not fully aware of or they don't fully uh, analyze properly. So I might start by dropping you into a scene in which you start your book off here. And this is a scene in 2010 in Seoul and I suppose across Korea as well. And the World Cup is on and the country is in rapture and all, this, all, this, all, all the celebrities are on TV and out on the streets and everyone is quite excited. And yet there's complete absence of North Korea in everything that we see on the ground and on the TV as well. So why is this important? I might want you to take us to this scene, this picture, and why this is such a fundamental insight into Korean nationalism and where it is today. Yeah, well, it's a really, I think, interesting starting point for my thesis. Um, so I was in South Korea doing research um, for my book in 2010 during the football soccer world cup and what was particularly interesting about this world cup um, was that it was the first time both north korea and south korea um, had 
both participated at the same time in the World Cup. And um, there was tremendous excitement around the World Cup. Um, but I was overwhelmed by the passion and focus on the role of South Korea and the South Korean team um, in the advertising, in discussions, in, in the media, um, and the complete absence of North Korea in any of that celebration. Um, and for me, it was just the perfect example um, of the national symbol of South Korea um, and the absence of any passion or reference um, to North Korea. Um, and, and that continued on, on, on the streets. So I remember uh, going for a walk um, along the Han River to go and watch North Korea play on one of the big screens um, that they'd set up for the World Cup, thinking that there would be quite a big crowd there. I think it was North Korea versus Portugal. Um, and to turn up, my friend and I, and we took some snacks and some beers and there were perhaps, you know, another few couples who had happened to stop just because they were going for a walk and had chanced upon the match. Um, and and it, even though I'd been doing a little bit already, my research was quite advanced. Um, it, it still stuck with me, the complete absence of, of North Korea in this discussion around the World Cup. And uh, why is that so important? I suppose... We should open up a, a question here of uh, Korean nationalism, uh, nationalism through the history a little bit. Uh, I suppose we have to break open this question of uh, ethnic nationalism, or at least the idea of a divided ethnic nation. Um, so why was it so important? Why was this such a fundamental moment that North Korea wasn't being mentioned? I have to assume that uh, at least some of the history of this would imply at least some of the claims about ethnic nationalism inside South Korea would claim that uh, South Koreans, if they really did still see themselves as such a homogenous ethnic nation, they would be similarly excited about celebrating their North Korean brothers and sisters as well. So um, this is a very brief opening. What is um, this history and this idea of ethnic nationalism in South Korea? And uh, why was it so important at that moment in that context that we weren't seeing North Korea? So, I mean, when you think about the two Koreas and when you think about expressions of the nation and nationalism in Korea, I think that most scholars, when they or, or most students of Korea, when they first come to it, immediately think of ethnic nationalism. So, uh, you the, the history of, of, of Korea and ha has always been framed around ethnic nationalism, both before uh, and after um, division, but if, particularly after division. Um, a lot of nationalism in Korea, particularly through the student movement, has been framed around Tanil Minjok, one nation, um, unification of North and South Korea, um, and an assumption that people in the North and people in the South are the same, um, a nationalism that has tried to passionately work towards unification of North and South Korea. Um, and so to see the absence of North Korea and the disinterest in North Korea so blatantly challenges those previously held assumptions that the idea of nation and the idea of identity in North and South Korea is based on um, simply, you know, ethnicity and, and, and the idea of one, one nation. Um, and, and, and really, that, that's how I came to this topic to begin with. I, I um, came to learn about Korea while studying in China. I met many South Koreans, this was in the mid 90s, who were also studying um, Chinese and I uh, fell in love with South Korea and South Korean culture and would 
travel to to South Korea and and through my interest in South Korea I also became very interested in 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 North Korea also first traveled to North Korea in the mid mid 90s 97 um but the more often I traveled to 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 South Korea and spoke to friends about North Korea um the more apparent it it, it became that most South Koreans were just simply not interested in the north didn't have time to to think about it were much more interested in um you know topics about south korea about the uk where i come from um and for people like myself who have come from overseas who who just assume that um unification and north korea is so integral to the everyday life of south koreans that was a real a real shock and has has driven this interest in this research so i'm going to ask you a question now that i suppose is going to slightly touch on i suppose your central thesis here which we're going to get to at the end of the podcast i promise but it does give a good indication of just how things are changing and how they're coming about so i suppose what you've indicated there is is a, a rapidly changing idea about uh uni- about unification as you said at the end of the korean war it was a it was a very important thing for you for un- not just unification but an ethnic nation state and uh as you write in your research here uh, when you look at uh, at opinion polls over time there is a quite a steady shift away to away from north korea and with more negative sentiment being expressed towards north korea and you write here and this is important i think for many people who don't perhaps don't uh, have a strong understanding of what south korea is as a country and how the dynamics are on the ground and as i said this will have import for where we're heading in this podcast here and that's the, that's what you say here it is korea is a country transforming so quickly that even the oldest and youngest siblings can find themselves growing up in very different worlds so i might get you to start and uh, begin with a, i suppose an explanation of South Korea today and how fast it is transforming and how and the change in those opinion polls and how I suppose dramatic this recent change in um expression towards uh, nationalism can be occurring. Okay, so uh, if we take those questions I guess one one by one by one and we'll come to the impact of change in South Korea perhaps a, a, a little later but I think for anybody who has been regularly visiting South Korea um they'll share my uh, I guess reflections on the speed of of change of the country um it, the the rate of change is so dramatic in terms of um social experience um the experiences of young people who've who've traveled i mean it was only in i guess the 80s um that it was easy to get a passport or possible to get a passport and and travel overseas um from in in south korea um the the rate of change around its democratization um the changes to the education system I mean they're happening on that the change of um to the social fabric and in in terms of attitudes to family and so on Th- these changes are happening you know, almost on a on a yearly basis and the experiences of one person um can are so incredibly different to someone who comes along 5 years 5 years later and and that is creating i guess very different attitudes to issues such as unification and identity amongst um and between generations um and we see this in changing attitudes to unification so um whilst some older Koreans um may still express very positive views or hopeful views about unification still show an interest in North Korea um you see that young people increasingly um are disinterested in unification um with North Korea are not interested in general about what is happening uh in in North Korea they don't talk about 
what is happening. It's not written about anymore in student newspapers. Um, and that has changed dramatically over time. So you saw in the 70s, 80s and 90s um, unification, not, not always, but because it was also um, politically sensitive and, and risky, but unification did play a very important um, role in the discussion, in the motivation of student and student movements. Um, and that has, for the most part, disappeared um, from student and from the activities of young people and, and students in South Korean universities and, and other higher education um, establishments. Not only has, I guess, um, levels of interest fall, fallen, you see increasingly uh, high levels of ambivalence and antagonism towards unification. So um, whilst perhaps um, in the 1990s, you would have only a very small percentage, 10 or 11% of young people saying that they didn't think unification was, was um, needed. Now you're seeing numbers well over 50% of uh, saying that unification is not needed or that they don't, they simply don't want unification. And that is a huge change um, from previous generations. So I might ask from that, that leads us into a question, I suppose, that we should touch on here before we take a deep dive into some of the uh, of the details here. And that is your methodology, because it, it, for many people listening, it must sound like an incredibly hard subject to actually research and an incredibly hard uh, data set to nail down. You ask someone... Uh, what they think is their nation. It's not something that most people think about on a daily basis, and it must be hard to extract from people. So uh, how did you go about your research here, and uh, what difficulties did you find along the way? Um, so, I mean, I, I, I expected to have more difficulties than I encountered. Um, I, I thought that people would be perhaps nervous talking about unification or, or North Korea. Um, but generally, most of the young people that I met, um, uh, you know, were happy to engage with me on the topic and, and were extremely and surprisingly f frank in their engagement. Um, my, my methods, um, mainly in, were mainly uh, qualitative. So I did, gosh, interviews with nearly or over 150 students over um, a number of years. Most of those interviews were done in Korean language. Um, I visited a huge range of universities in Seoul, across the regions and all different levels and types of universities and higher education institutes. Um, and I, I mixed that qualitative work with an analysis of um, survey data that, that is, is relatively freely available in, in South Korea um, on attitudes to unification. And I mean, the, and and that's why I think some of my results are 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 often surprising. Having you know speaking to young people directly, because you would assume that in in South Korea still it would be um, perhaps socially unacceptable to say that you didn't want to unify with North Korea or you um, were hesitant about unifying with with North Korea. Um, and yet so many of the young people I spoke to um, express those sentiments quite freely and quite, quite openly. Um, and, and so that would suggest actually that it's, um, um, you know, the, the sense of fear about or, or antagonism towards unification is, is actually underestimated in, in my work. So um, that there's actually a much stronger 
sense of antagonism towards unification than than is suggested in 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 my book um um and that's that was very um very interesting um I was also the other thing that that struck me was was also the openness with which many young people expressed difference and um, sometimes fear of uh, North Korean migrants to South Korea and also other ethnic Korean um, migrants, including Cho Um That was also often quite quite surprising. Um, I found that just relying on survey data is insufficient. And, and one reason, one example of this is when you look at survey data, there are still significant numbers of young people who say they want unification or they think unification is necessary. But when you sit, and, and it's easy to tick a box in a survey to say, yes, I think unification is necessary. But when you sit down with those young people and say, okay, you think unification is necessary, but upon what basis? They will often say, yeah, I think it's necessary, but I only want it to happen if um, there's no impact on South Korea or only if it brings net benefits to South Korea. Um, I, I met one young person who said, I want unification with North Korea, but not in my lifetime. And I think that's why it's important to look beyond just survey data uh, to have a better understanding of, of some of the concerns and feelings towards these issues. So let's uh, <clears throat> jump into some of the history here and begin to build this up. And once we've cleared out some of the history, we'll begin to circle around and really narrow in on your thesis here. So as you mentioned before, this idea of the Minjok or the ethnic, the ethno-racial state, this idea... Um, it has it, it's, it has a claimed longer history than it has. It was not something that's always existed. In fact, in your writing here and and your and your research, it it really came about uh, around the Japanese colonial period. So, uh, and that is an important thought process here. That um, at least you reference a lot of re of research that comes across and says. Um, so, uh, for all the for all these claims of a much deeper history, uh, there really wasn't particularly a strong sense of 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 nation inside Korea until the Japanese colonial period, and then this comes about. At least it seems to come about because the Koreans recognised that they were all being suddenly oppressed, and that may have been one of the key things that galvanised them and brought them all together. Yeah. So when we talk about nationalism. Um, we 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 need to think about nationalism in two parts. So um, nationalism and the theory of nationalism is about how nations come into being in the first place. And then we think about how um, when that nation has come into being, nationalist sentiment, which expresses, I, I guess, um, satisfaction um, about the fulfillment of that nation or anger if somehow um, that that idea of nation has been challenged by uh, either internal or external forces. And the work of Ernest Gellner, I think, is, is very useful in trying to understand basic definitions of, of nationalism. And many scholars think of the creation of Korea as, as one based upon one ethne, one ethnic group, um, that it, it's it's a, a natural, um, it was a natural creation around the idea of the, the Korean race or the, the, the Korean ethne. Um, but I, I argue using the work of um, authors and academics such as Cummings and Henry M um, and theoretical arguments of people like um, Benedict Anderson um, that Korea um, as a nation came into being um, as a result of modernity. Um, so that would have been as a result of, for example, colonization when um, Koreans were able to define themselves with regards to the other, i.e. the colonizer. Um, and Cummings writes something very, very interesting around this. And um, 
whilst other scholars perhaps argue that you know all Koreans looked to each other and thought they were similar, he he argues that um, before modernity and before colonization, um, the the nature of Korean society meant that those at the very bottom of the heap, the slaves and so on, would not have um, would not have considered themselves to be part of a nation with a yangban with an elite that that were um, that were enslaving them that that were uh, discriminating against them um, and so it's really modernity that has began to to shape the Korean identity and the idea of Koreans as a as a nation um, through through language and and through defining themselves with relation to the other, i.e. the Japanese colonizers. Um, and that that follows the ideas of Ernest Gellner, um, Benedict Anderson, who see the formation of nations as a as a a modern modern construct, um, not something based in, you know, primordial uh, ethnic ideas such as, you know, Tanil Minjok. So let's take a step forward in history then to some of the politics that happened after the end of Second World War and the division of Korea. And this becomes this becomes quite important and it explains where we're heading with this as well. And this is the idea of uh, Sun Man Rhee when he comes to power. And you write that ethno-nationalism becomes uh, a very important uh, mobilizer for his presidency. So a politician like himself uses this thing and it becomes, uh, I suppose, an inspiration for his own government and a, 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 I suppose, a foundation for everything that he is going to sit upon, this idea that he was once a, um, a anti-Japanese uh, free, freedom, freedom fighter of sorts, often from a distance itself. But uh, it, it seems to fuse a lot of things together and becomes a very useful political tool for Sung Man Rhee when he comes to power. And, and of course, you know, um, authoritarian uh, leaders um, often rely on nationalism. And, and in Korea, they've been able to rely on ethnic nationalism because of, in particular, the division of the nation to galvanize their power, um, to, to justify their power by using the other, i.e., North Korea, um, and also the use of ethnic nationalism to justify an authoritarian regime um, in the pursuit of developing the country for the for the purported betterment of um, the population. And so we see um, under uh, Singman or Ri Singman um, the use of ethnic nationalism to control and to justify his his power. Um, but um, we also see in the response to that among students um, a similar nationalist motivation to challenge his power, um, you know, a motivation to uh, respond to the failures of the Ri Singman government to develop the country and um, and that kind of patriotic drive, I think, drove um, or what provided the underlying motivation for the April Revolution, Sa Il Gu, which um, ultimately brought an end to the Singman Rhee government. So that that attempt to use ethnic nationalism to control the populace was then used turned against Singman Rhee by the students who said, well, you've actually failed to achieve what what you were purporting to do. Um, and we um, we challenge you and brought down his government in the interests of um, the people of, of Korea. And that, of course, bleeds us into, yeah, I suppose you mentioned it there as well, uh, the Park Chung-hee era and the mobilization of nationalism for developmental goals as well. And of course, this runs through to Chandu Wan. So we're talking dictators here and the suppression of uprisings in places like Guangzhou. So uh, this um, is in some ways the, uh, 
uh, I, I suppose the the pre democratic history of um, Korean nationalism in some ways. So uh, let's walk this up to that period and uh, put a bow on this in some ways. Uh, how did how did this con- how did this continue to manifest? As I touched on there through your research, you talk about how important it was for Park Chun Hee to mobilize this. But of course, Chandu One is sitting at a strange moment too in history where he is justifying his coup and his support Depression in terms of uh, nationalism and the threat from North Korea, and at the same time, the people on the streets that are, are fighting themselves for their own claim of nationalism. Of course, a lot of those street protesters, the the left motivated side of South Korean politics, are in power today, or at least around the controls of power in the current Moon Jae-in government. Yeah, and and so you see this theme of nationalism. Throughout the student movement from the um, Ri Singman era um, into the the Chan Du Huan era, um, and it, it takes different forms. So as as I, I said, it it takes um, the form of demanding um, effective government to revitalize and and make the Korean the Korean nation successful. Um, that sense of nationalism in the student movement throughout that period also um, reflects the desire for unification. Um, that was also the case during the Ri Singman period, perhaps less so during the Pak Chung Hee period, just because um, an association with unification and therefore North Korea was so dangerous. Um, during the Pak Chung Hee era, but certainly in the 19, uh, 1980s, um, unification became a very anti-Americanism and unification became a very strong driving force and motivation for South Korean students to challenge um, the legitimacy of the Chan Du Hwan government. So let's move forward and touch on the current environment. I suppose the intellectual and cultural environment that you walked into when you were doing your research. So a lot of that history is out of the way, though still quite vibrant and still affecting things. And yet, as you walked into the field and as you as you were doing your research, uh, uh, there is still a sentiment out there, and there's still a lot of books out there claiming the importance of uh, uh, eth- uh, ethno nationalism in South Korea. And I suppose there could be a number of very uh, in, uh, interesting reasons for this. But one of the ones you touch on in your research here, which I suppose, uh, again, hints towards your uh, thesis, which we are coming to, is you write that uh, it may be the case that uh, it was the um, modernization and the globalization and the, uh, I suppose, um, changes in migration, as in more migrants coming to South Korea and places like this, that did the opposite to what many people might expect would happen to their national identity. So with with all these rapid changes happening around them, with changes happening to their society, it's it's almost like a, a tripwire moment in some people's minds where they, instead of embracing the changes that they recognize come into them and recognize that they actually feel themselves, they revert back to the ethno-nationalism uh, that they may have had or they may have been taught in their younger years as a kind of fear that this is rapidly disappearing before my eyes. Um, so, I mean, there are some discussions around globalization and nationalism, and the idea um, that that globalization tends to intensify certainly nationalist feelings, um, and in particular, ethno nationalist. Uh, feeling so it intensifies um, ethnic nationalism and my thesis uh, challenges that um, I I instead say globalization has the effect of changing ideas of nationalism um, but it it um, rather than intensifying um, an existing ethnic nationalism and and that happens in a variety of of, of different ways, which my book explores. Mm. 
So let's walk into some of those ways. So one of the things that, of course, is important here, and you mentioned, is the change in um, ethnic face, of course, of South Korea. And you say and that there are 1.5 million foreigners in South Korea. And, of course, this is making a significant change inside the country, not just in how it looks, but how it thinks. So uh, this becomes uh, one of those uh, important issues for a country that is changing dramatically. Um, and, of course, it, it does beg a, a slight question. And many people still have this image out there that South Korea is not a welcoming country towards immigration. And yet you write here that in some ways it is. And yet I suppose we should mention the same thing, something you touched on, a very interesting thing you touched on earlier, that despite being incredibly welcoming to immigration and the idea that new immigrants can become Koreans in some ways, um, you, you mentioned that they are not so welcome to the Joseon Jok, which, of course, for people listening, that is the uh, Korean community living, uh, the ethnic Korean community living in China. Yeah, so um, when, we're, when we're looking at a new South Korean... So, so my argument is that um, young people in South Korea no longer consider themselves Korean. Um, they consider themselves South Korean. Um, and I challenge the idea of, of a Korean ethnic nationalism and suggest that um, ethnic nationalism no longer exists uh, and instead um, the the South Korean uh, South Korean nationalism at least amongst young people is defined as what I call a globalized cultural nationalism and um, that nationalism uh, pride in your country how um, what you I guess define and understand your country to be um, is defined by ideas um, of modernity, of cosmopolitanism, um, and the importance of status. It's not defined by belonging to the Korean nation or having holding Korean ethnicity. Um, so if you want to be accepted by other young South Koreans, um, you need to display, hold on to these types of characteristics. So you see that young South Koreans, when they're expressing their identity as being a proud South Korean, they talk about pride in the modernity of South Korea, in its economic growth. Um, one, one thing that's very interesting when I spoke to young South Koreans was how frustrated they were when they traveled overseas and the people they met didn't understand or know or recognize to South Korea to be you know, an in incredibly modern and successful country. Um, for example, um, one of them was asked whether or not they had, uh, you know, fridges and telephones in their, in their country. Um, and that student was like, the phone that you have in your hand is made in South Korea. <laughs> you know, that, that, that sense of frustration and pride in what South Korea has, has created. And so, for example, when I was speaking to a, a very senior advertising um, executive, he was saying that if you want to engage with South Koreans and, and um, attract South Koreans to a particular product, pull on their heartstrings, um, your advertising has to be you know, modern and cutting edge because that's what engages them and that's what they're proud of. Um, and you see that sense of modernity and pride in that in the way that a lot of traditional cultures have been modernized. So they're still proud of Korean cultures such as, I don't know, drinking makoli or eating tteokbokki, but the way that it's done now in South Korea is incredibly modern. Um, so that's one way that I think young South Koreans are expressing their identity and, and national identity. And, and and another way is, I guess, this sense of cosmopolitanism. So um, the pride and importance um, to young people and young people's identity of things such as um, the international experience of young Koreans, the cultural sophistication um, that many young people 
Korean exhibit um, and of course the incredible levels of learning and education of of South Korean the the pride in that and the pride in that achievement is an integral part of expressions of young South Koreans um, national identity um, and I think lastly a, another expression is around status uh, in particular the status of the South Korean nation there's incredible pride in Hallyu um, in K-pop in Korea the, the spread of Korean popular culture um, you see it also in the anger amongst young South Koreans um, by uh, the challenges presented by the uh, issue of Dokdo, um, Kogurio and the EC and their perceived failures of countries such as China and Japan to recognize that um, these lands belong to South Korea or to Korea. Um, and you even see like a, a real sense of anger around the behaviors of Korean politicians not being modern, um, you know, and the behaviors of some South Koreans when they, they travel overseas. So this sense of status that Korea is sophisticated and modern is really important to young people's South, um, young people's I I idea of identity and national identity. So this is interesting, and of course, this is what we're coming to, this globalized cultural nationalism, which is a very interesting thought, very interesting phenomena inside South Korea, as you touch on here. And of course, this is your central thesis of what we're going to nail in. Uh, I suppose we should touch on a question here, and this is something that I think you made me feel hear this phrase so often that it's probably lost a lot of meaning in their heads, and that's the idea of civic nationalism. So how would they, uh, this uh, globalized cultural nationalism di uh, differ from a civic nationalism? And I suppose, what is civic nationalism? Um, so civic nationalism is different to, I guess, um, I, my idea of a globalized cultural nationalism. Um, civic nationalism is one where your sense of identity is more defined by, um, I guess, political institutions and engagement with civic ideas and laws and so on. Um, globalized cultural nationalism is, is, is much more um, about an identity that of course has elements of pride in, in modern achievements of South Korea such as democracy but is not defined by democracy itself it is defined by as I've, I've talked about a sense of pride in modernity and the success of South Korea in cosmopolitanism in a lot of those neoliberal values of of individual achievement and status and and so on so that's the difference between my idea of or my definition or um, of this new South Korean nationalism and civic nationalism which is very much defined by um, uh, an expression of pride in your country because of civic institutions and laws and so on. So what is the, the, the strength of this nationalism? Because I know, and of course, there is a, a certain rise of um, claims of ethnic nationalism today, or at least a more historically rooted uh, civic nationalism today. And I know, at least from listening to the news, that a lot of the um, some of the complaints that people have out there, at least some of the charges that they level against these new forms of nationalism, is that they can't possibly be strong enough. The idea of a nationalism that changes quickly over time can't be something that sustains a people. So, how did you? How do you see this theoretical this theoretical uh, question here? Is it uh, a non-starter, or is there some value in the idea that um, there might be a weakness in this new nationalism, or these people simply uh, uh, gin something up for political gains here? Um, so, I think the the strength of or, or the um, I, I guess the the test of my thesis uh, as to whether or not this new um, uh, nationalism is is uh, in power or, or in in place in South Korea 
is looking at the experiences of ethnic Koreans who've moved to South Korea from countries such as China, the Chosun Jok, from North Korea, and from other places such as Japan, um, the uh, Koryoin or uh, Zainichi, um, and also uh, those who've come from um, countries such as the former, uh, sorry, Koryoin have come from some of the, the, the countries in the former USSR and the Cheo Kyopo and Zainichi from um, Japan. So one way to, to test my thesis is to, to look at the experiences of these uh, of, of people from the Korean diaspora when they come to, to South Korea. And so there's been some very interesting work by uh, Saul and Skrentney, who wrote in 2009 um, about this idea of the hierarchical nation to, I guess, describe the hierarchy among ethnic Koreans within South Korea and, and the experiences. Um, and it, it showed that South Koreans are, you know, of course, at the top of this hierarchy, followed by Korean Americans. Um, and those at the bottom were Joseon Jok and, and North Koreans. And that hierarchy was based on you know, attitudes to those who've moved to, to South Korea. It reflected um, their position and their rights within immigration law in South Korea, um, as well as their experiences um, living and, and, and working there. And so, um, you know, if ethnic nationalism really is the determinant for membership of the Korean nation, you wouldn't have that hierarchy. You know, the mere fact that you are um, ethnically Korean would allow you to be uh, welcomed and part of the South Korean nation. And um, what instead you see is those ethnic Koreans that come that exhibit the characteristics of globalized cultural nationalism, i.e., modernity, um, cosmopolitanism, status, i.e. those who are relatively wealthy and highly educated, are accepted. Um, but those ethnic Koreans who don't exhibit those globalised cultural nationalist um, uh, characteristics are excluded from the community. So what do you make of, um, I suppose, some of the, and this is something that does come out through your research, you talk a lot about, um, difficult questions of how nationalism actually manifests in people's daily lives and how they are how they are or can be aware of their own nationalism in some ways and I've seen this through some of the debates about uh, what Korean nationalism is today between the two fields that it's a new type of nationalism or if it's still an ethno nationalism and a lot of the complaints come down to an idea uh, sort of a lot of the, de uh, the debates come down to an idea that um, there's a I suppose a different ways of seeing it. There's a, a shallow and a deep nationalism, as in um, some ideas, so perhaps ethno-nationalism is still fundamental, it's a sit-in latent and underneath people's ideas and everything else that they express about their daily lives is just superficial and it's just on the surface here. And so how do you see challenges like this and how do you see, I suppose, how nationalism sits in the mind is it, it is it possible for there to be this this kind of fundamental break between how people think about themselves or is it um how they actually act in their daily lives really manifests uh what they think about the world as well so um i i, I mean i i would say that that's wishful thinking and um i think that has been some of the challenge of unification policy in that there has been an unwillingness to come to terms with and address the changing attitudes of many people in South Korea um, to identity and to what being Korean means and then of course to unification and um, we, we don't know what form if unification were to take place, what form it, it how it will come about, whether it will be gradual um, or dramatic. Um, and to simply ignore the changes in attitudes, the changes in a sense of identity and relationship with North Korea, I think it, it, it is, I think it is, wish, it is wishful thinking um, 
that somehow uh, there is a, a latent ethnic nationalism that will suddenly arise if the two Koreas were to unify. I think to ignore the changes in ideas of identity and the changes in the relationship between young people in particular in South Korea and the North Korean nation um, creates tremendous uh, a tremendous threat to a successful unification were it to take place. Um, and I think we can, based on the evidence that we see in the daily lives of young people, we cannot just assume that all of a sudden they will rediscover their sense of um, Kanil Minjok and a relationship with North Korea if unification were to happen very dramatically. Um, and 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 I think that's why my, I think that's why my thesis is so important because it has serious implications um, for unification and also for the experiences of many North Koreans and Chosun Jok um, and other migrants who come to South Korea to make a life. So on that same thing, I, I, I know you do a lot of uh, research and work with North Korea as well. We're not going to get into that today, of course, but um, a lot of people say that uh, if maybe South Korea is a changing country in terms of ethno-nationalism, but North Korea is not. North Korea is still a strong ethno-nation state. So I wonder what you think, what you just on a, I suppose it's a slightly side topic here. What do you, how do you see North Korean national? I know it's a much harder one to get your hands around, but do you think North Korea are still the ethno-nation state that they have still kept their history in a way? And, and I suppose it, it does have input for your thesis. Um, if for, 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 for example, uh, South Korea is changing so dramatically, it's, it's become this multicultural uh, nationalism in a sense. Uh, maybe North Korea, <coughs> by definition, hasn't had this kind of change. Sure. So, <coughs> of course, um, it, well, I, I, the first thing to say, it, it's very hard to do research in North Korea um, and to understand how North Koreans, I guess, um, do, express their nationalism in a, on a daily basis, how they conceive of then their nation, um, just because it's it's so difficult to to do the kind of research that's required. And it's even hard to do that type of research amongst North Koreans who've moved to the South. There's not a huge number. And um, uh, given the precariousness of 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 life for many North Koreans in in the South to perhaps challenge dominant narratives of ideas of Korean identity um, that exist in the South is very very difficult for them. Um, but it is inevitable that the the identity of North Koreans, the, the things that make them proud, um, that make them celebrate their community, their their nation will be very different to to those manifestations of nationalism that we see in the South um, because of the very different experiences. Um, and for example, uh, um, they haven't experienced globalization, neoliberalism in the way that the South have. They haven't experienced um, democratization, um, They've had a very different education system to the South. And so certainly for younger generations, um, they've have gone through very different systems to the young people in the South. So, of course, um, national identity and expressions of national identity will be very different. And, and that's why it's very important when we're contemplating unification to um, have a better sense of of identity of 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 different people in different communities you see at the moment when north koreans move to the south they are taken into hanawon and in inverted commas taught how to be koreans south koreans um, by essentially being coached in neo liberal values and what is presented to them as being Korean is 
a South Korean image of being Korean, and that is being middle class, um, global, neoliberal. And often you see some of the first things that North Koreans spend their money on when they come out of Hanawon um, are particular when they don't have a lot of money to do this. They buy, um, you know, mobile phones, they buy items that express status and um, being part of middle class South Korea, because that's what they've been taught being Korean and South Korean is. Um, And that's problematic because there, I'm sure, many things to celebrate um, in the North Korean identity. And and that should be considered as authentic an identity as the Korean identity in the South. So as a last few questions, let's really drill down into this thesis. And one of the things that has been striking me throughout this, and it is mentioned in your book as well quite significantly, is that this uh, new globalized nationalism, in a way, is there's a co- there's a competitive instinct to it too, as in this is a competitive world and you are now a multicultural globalized member of it. And so you, you must have, a, there must be a deeply ingrained competitive instinct in this. And I wa- I'm wondering how the financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis of, 19, of 1997 may have impacted the rise of such a nationalism. It, it, it feels like it could be a, a quite a fundamental pivotal moment where South Koreans um, were forced to confront a certain failure of sorts and a certain failure in the international uh, eyes and the international order. And it may have been a, a strong impetus for the growth of this nationalism that you speak about today. Sure. So one of the arguments that I make in um, in my in my work is that young people in South Korea have intentionally adopted and chosen this idea of a South Korean nationalism. Um, and they've done this because life for young people in South Korea is so competitive. Um, one student newspaper um, described it as a survival of the fittest culture where um, finding jobs uh, that are secure and well paid um, is so difficult for young people getting onto the housing market you know South Korea has I think one of if not the highest proportion of tertiary educated um, young people in the world Um, and so differentiating yourself from your competitor is incredibly hard Um, and so Faced with that challenge, um, why would you want to risk unification with North Korea, a a country, a place that you have now little in common with, um, given the difficulties that so many young people face in their daily life, um, even within kind of the stable South Korea as it currently exists? And that sense of uncertainty, I think, has been um, reinforced by a number of experiences. One of those is, of course, the unification of East and West Germany, um, which um, I think the, most people think it was relatively successful, um, not least because the current Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, was from East Germany. I mean, that's that's an incredible achievement, but you know, economically and socially was successful. But still, it was a huge challenge. And I think many South Koreans see, well, look, if it was a challenge for countries like East and West Germany, given that the difference between the two countries was much less significant than that of North and South Korea, they also had tremendous support from the European Union. Um, it was difficult for the two Germanys. Imagine how it's going to be for North and South Korea. And I think the other experience is that of the Asian economic crisis. And the young people that I spoke to still had memories of the tremendous um, difficulties that the Asian economic crisis brought to their families. And that memory, I think, reinforces the fear um, of, of the economic challenge that could be brought about by unification and and so that combination of this survival of the fittest culture with the uncertainty over what unification will bring um, really uh, I think 
makes many young people fear unification and actively hold on to an idea of being a national identity that only consists of South Korea. So um, I read in your research here that you mentioned President Lee Moon Bak. So I'm assuming that when you're doing the research, Lee Moon Bak was in power. So I might finish with a, a, a couple of questions about how you see the future of Korean nationalism and how maybe you've seen it change when, since you were on the ground there, or at least how you've seen the political side of it change. Because uh, since Lee Moon Bak, you had Park Geun-hye, who was, who was a right-wing politician as well. And now you have uh, Moon Jae-in, who came in with quite uh, substantial popularity. And his popularity hasn't dipped as low as uh, it tends to be the case with um, South Korean politics. So I wonder how you see um, this manifesting uh, as a broader long-term phenomenon. I was, the reason I mentioned the two politicians there is because people like um, Moon Jae-in have a, quite a strong outreach to North Korea. So I, I wonder why you think this may be the case that a president like himself still, and of course left-wing president, uh, still feels the need to make such outreach. Is it simply that he is um, perhaps passing his language and he realised he's got a broad voting block across South Korea and he needs to bring in uh, the older generation as well to vote for him? Or is he maybe out of step? with a, a younger change in South Korea and perhaps he may be one of the last politicians that will be able to come into power on such a pro-Northern uh, platform. And, of course, his pro-Northern platform isn't just to be nice to North Korea but to have things like confederation and stuff like this. Um, so I think we need to perhaps separate the daily politics of Korea, uh, North and, uh, Korea and with regards to North and South Korea um, from this longer term trend around national identity and, and so on. Um, like certainly, I think most people in, in Korea want to uh, live in peace and in harmony on the Korean peninsula um, and um, would, you know, depending on their politics, would encourage whatever colour government to um, have constructive policies towards engaging the North. Um, but the trends around changing attitudes of young people um, to North Korea and to national identity are really rooted in this global 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 change, um, the neoliberalization of South Korea, the globalization of, of South Korea, um, which looks set to continue even under um, more left-wing governments such as Moon Jae-in, um, unless there are radical policy changes. We still see in Korea um, um, a, a situation where young people face very uh, face insecure work, um, low wages. Um, we still see tremendous difficulties for young people in finding um, finding jobs, uh, securing accommodation, um, buying a house, um, attracting a marriage partner. So until some of those challenges are, are changed, until um, the pace of globalization changes, I, I can't see... Um, a radical change in this trend that we're seeing towards a growing sense of a South Korean identity, um, and there are the, the South Korean identity is 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 rooted in 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 many other factors. So, for example, it, it it's come over, it's developed over a, a long period of of, of time. Um, it's developed as South Korea's democracy has developed. So you have a parliament and a democracy that rules on behalf of South Koreans. And of course, that idea um, has created um, or started to shape the, the political um, South Korea has also started to shape um, a national republic of, of Korea. Um, and, and ideas of, of, of what uh, an author called Michael Billig has called um, banal nationalism. So 
these young South Koreans have grown up in a country where every day they are reminded, not that they live in a Korea divided, but they, that they live in South Korea. When um, they vote in an election, it's for a South Korean government. When they walk down the street, they see a South Korean flag. When they describe themselves, they describe themselves as South Korean. Um, these are not things that will change rapidly, merely um, based on, on changing policies by a South Korean government towards the North Korean um, the North Korean regime because they are, are are rooted in many years of democratization and globalization of the South. So my final question was actually going to be about the longevity of this uh, new nationalism. I think you might have summed it up there quite nicely. That might be a good place to end the podcast on, actually. So um, the book we've been speaking about today is uh, South Korea's New Nationalism. I'm going to link the links below the podcast. People can go and have a look for themselves. I do encourage them. It is a fascinating read and a lot of, of fundamental, important empirical data in there. But a lot of your work also focuses on North Korea as well. So I'm going to introduce a website that you run, and I might get you to mention it here yourself. That is um, uh, nkhumanitarian.org. So what exactly is this website and uh, what is its purpose? Sure. Well, I'd encourage people who follow um, events in the DPRK to, to have a look at the, the website. Um, it, the website really just uh, aims to contain information um, about humanitarian activities that are going on in the DPRK at the moment. So it aims to be a website that just collates as much information for people working on North Korea who want to know who's working there, what the current, uh, what the current humanitarian situation is, um, uh, what kind of work is being undertaken to alleviate um, some of the challenges that North Koreans face in their daily lives. Um, but also it has an excellent sec section on sanctions. Um, it does focus on the impact of sanctions on humanitarian aid and engagement with the DPRK, but it also has an excellent timeline of every sanction that's been enacted um, when uh, humanitarian organizations have been successful in getting exemptions um, so it's a tremendous resource for those organizations themselves who are working there or thinking about working there for academics who want to discuss um, humanitarian engagement with North Korea and for anyone else who just you know cares about the humanitarian situation of of the normal people in the DPRK and has an interest in in working together to improve it. So the link for that website is going to be below the podcast, as is uh, Emma's book as well. I do encourage listeners to go and look at both of themselves. So on that, uh, Emma Campbell, thanks for coming on the Career Now podcast. Thank you very much for having me. 